أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وله الحمد في الآخرة وهو الحكيم الخبير والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث إلى كافة الورى بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وعلى أهل بيته أئمة الهدى ومصابيح الدجا الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرزق وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ففهمنا سليمان وكلا آتينا حكما وعلما صلى الله عليه محمد وعلى محمد My respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Yesterday, we looked at the concept of teaching in Islam and we did so with reference to the story of Nabi Adam ala nabiyyina wa alayhi wa alihi salam as put forward by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. And today, inshallah, we'll be looking at the other side of the coin for we will be examining the concept of learning in Islam. And in particular, I will focus my attention on part of the story of Nabi Sulaiman ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alihi salam, who of course in English is known as Prophet Solomon. And inshallah, we will also look at how parents can contribute and improve the madrasa learning of their children. So we will examine this whole topic in the following four stages. First of all, just a little bit about Prophet Solomon and his life. Then we will look at the fact that he was blessed with both knowledge and wisdom. And we will see an example of that from the Quran. Thirdly, we will ask this question and try to address it that how can we gain such knowledge and then finally we will look at some strategies as to how parents can improve and contribute towards the madrasa learning of their children starting with a loud salawat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad so with regards to the first part of this talk just a little bit about this great prophet of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Prophet Solomon and Nabi Sulaiman as he's known in Arabic. So we are told in Surah Sa'd verse number 30 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted him to his father Nabi Dawood, Prophet David. And this word gift is used in the verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوَهَبْنَا لِدَاوُودْ Sulaiman," And we gifted David Solomon. And then he goes on to say, Ni'mal Abd, what an excellent servant. Innahu Awab. He was someone who would often turn to Allah in prayer. So here we find some really, very, really high-ranking descriptions used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this great prophet. Things such as calling him an excellent and a brilliant servant of his and using the word awab someone who turns frequently to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prayer so this verse in itself tells us about the great station of this prophet of Allah and like I said he was a gift to his father David not just that though we are told that of course he is well known for this particular attribute and that is his vast kingdom. The kingdom of Sulaiman is something that we always hear a lot about. Not just that though, but also the knowledge of Solomon. 
This is something that is there and we hear so much about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Nabi Sulaiman with this great kingdom and this vast knowledge. But also with that knowledge, he gave him certain special powers as well. Powers such as what? Such as the ability to know the language of birds. Mantik, mantik tayr as it's referred to in the verses of the Quran. Not just the knowledge of birds, but also the language of other creatures as well. For indeed we learned that he spoke to those ants when he was coming in that valley of ants and other creatures as well. So he had these special powers, knowing the language of birds and other creatures, also birds, he was able to command them to be part of his army. They would stand in sort of like service to Prophet Solomon when he commanded them to do so. Not just birds and creatures, but also jinn. We are told in the verses that he was able to command the jinn. Jinn would die for him in the seas and they would find these hidden treasures for him. Also, we are told in the verses that they would build certain things for him, such as temples and other things. So, language of birds, command over the creatures and of jinn. Thirdly, he also had command over the wind. So we are told in the verses that he was able to command the wind to blow gently whenever and wherever he wished. Not just that though, he was able to command the wind to take him in his ship to distant places very, very quickly. So the verses tell us, for example, that in a morning, when he would command the wind to blow and to you know, take him in his ship, it would do so and he would be able to traverse the distance it would normally take him to travel one month in the span of one morning. The same would happen in an afternoon. So he would command the wind to take his ship to a distant place and he was able to travel the length of one month as he would normally travel over the course of simply one afternoon. So when you put one afternoon and one morning together, we can say in effect, in one day, he was able to traverse the distance it would normally take him to travel in the course of two whole months. So this is, these are just some examples of his great knowledge and his great powers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with because of his great station of being an abd, a servant of Allah and someone who would engage in regular worship and prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So this was just a brief overview about this great prophet as told to us in some of the verses of the Quran. Like I said, the second stage of this lecture will be about an example from his life as to the great knowledge and wisdom that he had. This example is told to us in chapter Al-Anbiya verses 78 and 79. And it concerns an incident involving a great farmer. So we have part of it mentioned in the Quran in these verses, but the rest of it is told to us in traditions. When we put them together, this is the story that we get. So this is farmer of grapes and he comes to Prophet Dawood, the father of Nabi Sulaiman. And he complains to him that there, there were these sheep who had wandered into his vineyard at night. When they wandered into his vineyard, they had caused some damage to his vines and his crops. So now, Nabi Dawood, he defers the judgment to his son, Nabi Sulaiman. This is so that the people could get even a better idea and to reinforce his position as a prophet of Allah so that they, under, they could understand about his God-given knowledge and his wisdom. Now, 
We are told in the verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him and Dawood with wisdom. This is the verse that I recited at the beginning of this lecture. فَفَهَّمْنَا سُلَيْمَانْ وَكُلًّا آتَيْنَا حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا So we made Sulaiman understand the correct ruling, meaning the correct ruling about this case, and we bless both of them, meaning his father and himself, Nabi Dawood and Nabi Sulaiman, with two important traits. One was great judgment, hukman, wa ilma, and great knowledge. Now, let's see how this works. So, it is important to bear something in mind that in the past, the Israelite prophets, they would judge in this type of situation in a particular way. So the previous prophets, when this type of situation arose, their judgment had been as follows, that the shepherds would have to pay compensation to the great farmers for allowing or not guarding their sheep well enough and so that when their sheep went into the vineyards and the farmlands of the farmers and they wreaked havoc and they caused this damage, the shepherds would be obliged to provide the farmers with a number of their sheep based on the amount of damage that they had done in compensation for destroying their crops. Now, when this judgment is deferred by Nabi Dawood to his son Nabi Sulaiman, Sulaiman hears the farmer out. He hears his complaint. And then, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, we gave him understanding. We blessed him with great understanding about this particular case. And so, what is the judgment of Nabi Dawood this time? He actually differs to the Israelite prophets. Like I said, they would say, in such a case, the farmer would, the, the shepherds would have to give their sheep to the farmer, depending on the amount of damage they, that they have done, they would give them a number of sheep. In this case, however, Nabi Sulaiman differed in his judgment slightly. He didn't say that the sheep must be given to the farmers. He allowed the, the shepherds to keep their sheep, but he said that you must give the farmers, the lambs that are born in the coming year. Not just the lambs, but also the milk that they produce in the year and also the wool that they produce in the coming year. So now the question arises, why? Why did Sulaiman differ in his judgment to the previous Israelite prophets? This is where the whole concept of wisdom comes in. Because the verse, like I mentioned, Allah blessed him and his father with two traits. Not just knowledge, but wisdom. Hukman wa ilma. What is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Well, wisdom is something different to knowledge. This is something at a higher level. Wisdom, we can say, is the ability to think and act using knowledge, experience, insight, common sense, and understanding. It's the ability to think and use all of these things. It's the ability, if you like, to apply that knowledge and experience, understanding, insight, and understanding and experience, all of these things in its most correct way. This is what we must try and achieve ourselves as well. Like we've been trying to do, we've been examining the great stories of these amazing prophets in the Quran, trying to make them applicable to our situation today in the modern world. The same thing goes with the story of Nabi Sulaiman. In particular, this whole concept of learning in Islam and using our learning in the sense that we can be called wise people using our learning, our experience, insight, understanding in a way that is the best possible application of that knowledge. Sulaiman, what he managed to do 
was to not just take knowledge and apply it just like previous people had done, but he managed to apply it to the case at hand and deal with that situation in a very wise way. Let me illustrate this whole concept of wisdom as we understand it in the Islamic faith in using the following example. It's like a doctor. You have all sorts of doctors. Let's say one doctor is extremely knowledgeable about medicine. He studied really well. He knows all the ins and outs of medicine. However, he's knowledgeable, but is he wise? Is he able to apply that knowledge to my particular problem or not? If he is, he's not just knowledgeable, but he's also a wise doctor. It's the same type of thing with Nabi Sulaiman and our situation in our lives. Are we able to apply what we know properly to the case at hand or not? Or do we just give general advice to everyone in every situation? Now, going back to the case of Sulaiman, he didn't just apply the same rulings as the previous prophets. He saw that in this situation, it's the circumstances are a little bit different to the circumstances of those previous cases. What was the differences? In the past, when the prophets had judged like they did, that the sheep themselves must be given to the farmers in compensation, it was because the crops had been destroyed completely. They were unable to recover, to produce for subsequent years. But in this particular case, it wasn't like that. The crops, the vines, remained intact. The sheep had only destroyed the crops and the produce up to the level of this year's produce. They were still intact. They could still be used for future years. And that's why the judgment wasn't give all the sheep to the farmer. It was give the lambs born in the coming year and their wool and their milk. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So you see my brothers and sisters, this is the application of knowledge to the situation at hand. Now, inshallah, let's try and make this more and more relevant to our situation. How can we, inshallah, do this and become not just knowledgeable but wise, following in the footsteps of these great prophets of Allah. So now, let's look at this wonderful tradition taught to us by the sixth holy Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq It's known as the tradition of Unwan al-Basri. Now, perhaps some of you have come across this. It's a very famous tradition. And Unwan al-Basri is the name of the transmitter of the tradition. He is a 94-year-old man. And the story, let me just put it into context before I go into the tradition and what we can learn from it. The context is as follows. This 94-year-old man wanted to learn from the sixth holy Imam when he came to Medina. So he approaches the Imam. Initially, the Imam, due to some reasons, does not accept to teach him. But then Unwan al-Basri insists and he persists in his request for the Imam to teach him. So eventually the Imam agrees. So now the Imam, first of all, he defines for him what is meant by knowledge in Islam. And inshallah, if we get a chance, we should really look into this quite lengthy but very important tradition. It's known as, like I said, the Hadith of Unwan al-Basri. It's been translated into English. And in fact, recently there's been a beautiful book that has this whole tradition in its entirety with some explanation as well. And that book is known as Liberated Soul. It's again, it's published by ICAST Press and it just came out last year in fact. So, in this tradition, the Imam first of all defines knowledge according to the true Islamic teachings about knowledge. He defines it as not being, simply learning more and more in a conventional way. Like, for example, learning in a classroom, learning from books, learning from listening to that or reading that. He defines it as light. Light that is placed into the heart 
of he whom Allah wishes to guide. Anyway, let's move on and talk about the three steps that the Imam puts forward to Anwar al-Basri as to how someone can gain this light, how someone can gain true knowledge. He says, for in arattal ilm fatlub awwalan fi nafsik hakikatal ubudiya. These are gems of wisdom. Really, we should write them up and place them, you know, in our houses, in our centers. In fact, I remember when I was studying in Qom, when we used to go to that famous center of learning, the famous madrasa known as Faydiya, we would see this beautiful tradition, these gems of guidance and wisdom written in that wonderful, beautiful calligraphy that the Persians use on the wall of this great madrasa, Madrasa Faizia, where so many of our great scholars have studied and trained over the years. And whenever we used to go there, I in particular would really marvel at this tradition as did many, many other students. It's one of those that really, when you look at it, you think about it carefully, it just gives you these goosebumps. It's an amazing tradition. So, first of all, the Imam says, if you want to seek this light, the first step, and I'm putting forward this because we're looking at learning in Islam. The whole concept about gaining light and true knowledge in Islam, and inshallah, like I said yesterday, these are things that are quite appropriate to discuss at this particular time because many of our younger brothers and sisters are engaged in exams. So, the first step, he says that فَإِنْ أَرَدْتَ الْعِلْمِ فَطْلُبْ أَوَّلًا فِي نَفْسِكْ حَقِيقَةَ الْأُبُودِيَّةِ If you want to gain this light, this knowledge, so then seek in your heart, first and foremost, True servitude. Seek in your heart to serve Allah with that knowledge. Seek in your heart that you have this very sincere intention. That's the first thing. How am I going to use this knowledge to serve Allah's cause? Whatever that might be. It might be Islamic knowledge. It might not be. It might be so-called secular knowledge. But all forms of knowledge can be used to serve Allah. You might be in a so-called secular field of study. Chemistry, maths, English, literature, whatever it might be. But what this is saying is that seek in your heart true servitude. Make a sincere intention. How can you help yourself, your family, your fellow human being, mankind in general to better themselves, to use it in a good way? to use it in a way that will improve society and the well-being of others. These are all very divine intentions and motives. So, this is the first thing. Then what? What al ilm bistimale? He says, and seek knowledge by putting it into use. Seek knowledge by sharing it with others, that's putting it into use, by Acting upon it, that's also putting it into use. Sometimes we learn things, but how much of it do we share it with others? These are all blessings, just like Allah blessed Nabi Dawood and Nabi Sulaiman with ilm and hikmah. We should also try to emulate them because they used it for the sake of Allah to help others. They shared it with Allah with others. Like I mentioned this example of using it to judge correctly and fairly and justly. Use it and share it with others. Don't be miserly with it. Allah will increase you in your knowledge if you share it with others and if you put it into use. Third step, the Imam tells Unwan al-Basri, وَاسْتَفْ هِمِ اللَّهِ And seek from Allah understanding. And if you do so, he will make you understand. For indeed, Allah, as we saw yesterday, He is the teacher with a capital T. He is the one who teaches everyone. Yes, He uses intermediaries. He uses agents to teach people, other teachers, human teachers. But 
He is the ultimate teacher. Wattakullah wa yu'allimukumullah. In Surah Baqarah verse 282, Allah tells us the relationship between purity of heart and learning. Have taqwa and Allah will teach you. Allam al insana ma lam ya'lam. He taught man that which he didn't know. So Imam Jafar Sadiq is telling Unwan al Basri, have this ability to, first of all, inshallah, this is something for all of us, seek true servitude, servitude in your heart, then seek knowledge in order and, and uh, by using it, and seek understanding from Allah. If you do this, He will make you understand, inshallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa now, like I said, I would like to put forward some strategies as to how parents can play a very effective role in the madrasa learning of their children. As we saw yesterday, we looked at teachers and the whole concept of teaching Islam. Today, we looked at learners and learning in Islam. How about parents? How can they improve the learning of their children? Now, I've looked at some modern research in this area, in particular how parents can help the learning of their children in regular schools. And I've drawn upon that research and I've adapted it to make it applicable and suitable for madrasa learning of our children. Because indeed many of these strategies are the same, but I've just adapted it to make it more suitable for madrasa learning. So, one of the things that I would like to put forward is the fact that if we are doing these things, this is very important for us to bear in mind as parents, if we are implementing these and other such strategies for these regular learning of our children, meaning the learning of our children in regular schools, okay? Let's just call them regular schools right now. The you know, schools they go to every day, but we are not doing the same when it comes to their madrasa learning, then what happens? There ends up being a dichotomy. There ends up being this sense, this perception, this feeling in our children that there's a, there's a gap, there's a difference between the two. One is more important, one is less important. Here, we are always going to face an uphill struggle if this is the case. If our children feel that all of these things our parents are doing for our regular learning in the schools, but when it comes to madrasa, they're not doing those things, therefore madrasa is less important. It's not as important. There will always be this dichotomy. Anyway, the first thing, we must have hopes, dreams and high ambitions for our children in their madrasa learning. This is a quote I will just read out from a group of scholars. I've got the references if anybody wants them. If you show your child that you believe in their potential and tell them that you know they can succeed, it can help your child build confidence, set higher expectations for themselves, and they can achieve better results. You see, having high expectations, dreams and aspirations for them really helps them. Let your child know that you think it's important they do well at madrasa. Setting clear objectives is very important in this as well. The clearer the objectives, the more motivated parents will be, students will be, and teachers will be to achieve those objectives. Secondly, help your child to enjoy madrasa learning. Children, this is another quote from another group of scholars. Children develop their attitudes and beliefs in their abilities from their parents. Be positive about madrasa and respectful of teachers. We know that there are all sorts of problems in the madrasas. Not this one or any particular madrasa. I don't know this madrasa well enough. But in all centers of learning, even in regular schools. But we should not talk about those problems and that teacher and this teacher in front of the children. 
because this has a very negative impact on how they look at that institution of learning. Sometimes we talk so openly about this person, about that person. First of all, it's riba, it's backbiting, it's haram. Secondly, we are conveying a very wrong message, a negative message. And then it impacts on them. Our children have these amazing invisible antennas, right? They pick up on vibes of their parents and they will not take it seriously. Make sure they're at madrasa on time. Just like we make sure our children are on time for school, why don't we do the same for madrasa? Like I said, if there's this dichotomy in their minds, they will think madrasa is less important. Respond to messages from madrasa in a timely and a constructive way. Communicate with the madrasa if there are any problems and encourage your child to learn from their mistakes. Remember yesterday we talked about the fact that Allah describes himself as Ar-Rahman, then Allama Al-Quran, as the all-compassionate, then the fact that he taught the Quran, being mercy before being able to teach our children effectively. It is a condition, we must be merciful with our children. Praise your child and for the effort and progress. Number three, talk with your child about their madrasa learning. Another group of scholars found that children who talk openly with their parents about their day have better educational outcomes. Other activities like discussing books, films or television programs or eating meals together around the table are also associated with better student reading performance. Ask them how, you know, the madrasa was. And sometimes, you know, don't start with really complex questions, you know. Did you achieve those learning objectives for history? You know, come on, don't start with that. Ask them, um, like, you know, what was fun about madrasa today? What did you do in the breaks? What did you eat? How was so-and-so, your friend? You know, start with these questions, but talk to them, engage with them, this has an impact on their madrasa learning. Teachers should tell parents what their children should be focusing on and practicing during the week, should be setting them appropriate homework. Alhamdulillah, I'm very glad to hear that this Jamaat has taken up the MCE, the Madrasa Center of Excellence syllabus and that program by the World Federation. And I know they have these exercises, they call them test yourself. So that can certainly be utilized. Number four, read with your children. Research showed parents that read out loud regularly with their children help them to do better. So, read the Quran, read du'as, stories of the prophets like we have been examining. And inshallah, I would like to put forward another book. It's by Sheikh Rizwan Arastu, God's Emissaries. It's brilliant um, on the stories of the Prophets um, and also stories of pious people, the Imams, the, again the MCE books, Alhamdulillah, have many stories that you can draw from and they also have key points. That's also a very useful point in the MCE syllabus. And finally, get involved with your children's madrasa. It's not a matter of us and them, you know, it's us together. It's parents and teachers together. How can we improve the madrasa learning of our children? It's a madrasa home relationship that we want to establish. Together, bringing our children forward and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their knowledge and in their actions. Being part of the madrasa is one way to ensure that your child has all the support they need. Talk with your children's teachers, meet with the principal to discuss how you can do better with your children and talk with other parents as well. Sometimes we feel only our child has such and such problem. When we share with other parents as well, we realize it's not an isolated case. We gain inspiration and ideas from other parents as well. So as a summary, Today we looked at the other side of the discussion yesterday. Yesterday we looked at the concept of teaching in Islam. Today we looked at the concept of 
learning in Islam and how parents can contribute towards the madrasa learning in particular of our children. We looked at it with reference to the great story of Nabi Sulaiman, how he was blessed by Allah and his father was with knowledge and wisdom. We saw how wisdom is the application in a very proper way of knowledge using experience, knowledge, understanding, insight and common sense. We saw Nabi Sulaiman is described as being a great servant of Allah, turning often to Allah in prayer and therefore Allah blessed him with his wisdom. Just like Imam Jafar al-Sadiq says to Anwan al-Basri, there are these three steps. Nabi Sulaiman was an embodiment of these three steps. Servitude or in your intention, then seeking knowledge by putting it into use and seeking knowledge from Allah for indeed he is the great teacher of us all. If we do this, just like Nabi Sulaiman did, he will bless us with judgment and wisdom and knowledge. Finally, we ended up looking at these five strategies as to how we can help with the madrasa learning of our children. Let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with the tawfiq to follow in the footsteps of the great prophets mentioned in his book. O oh Allah, enable us to contribute effectively and in a true Islamic way to the to the madrasa learning of our children, insha'Allah. O oh Allah, grant relief to all those who are facing difficulty around the world. O oh Allah, forgive us and our forefathers for our sins. And O oh Allah, hasten the appearance of the 12th Holy Imam, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajul sharif. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi